I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon for this symposium on Pachman Terrace after 50 years. My name is Thomas Lovergood. I'm executive director of the Lumen Christie Institute. We're delighted to be able to co-sponsor um, this event with the Committee on Social Thought of the University of Chicago and the Center for Civil and Human Rights of the University of Notre Dame Law School. And it's my great pleasure to present to you as moderator of today's session, Professor Paolo Corozza, who is professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School, director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, and the incoming or current director of the Kellogg Institute, um, which is involved in many questions dealing with Catholic social thought and peace, and especially with, re with respect to South America. He's been a longtime collaborator of the Lumen Christie Institute, and we're delighted to have done the work of organizing this with him and the other members of the committee. And of course, we're also very thankful for the um, support of the benefactors who make this possible, several of whom are with us here today. So thank you, Paolo, and thank you, everyone who's attending. Thank you, Thomas. And, uh, Thanks to all of you for, for coming this evening, also for uh, the presence of all of those who are joining us by live webcast in about 25 different places around the country this evening. Um, it, it's been a real privilege to collaborate uh, with the Lumen Christi Institute, and uh, we certainly hope that this uh, is the first of many, Thomas, between the Center for Civil and Human Rights and Lumen Christi. It was made possible on our end at Notre Dame uh, through the support of a variety of other entities at the university too, so tr truly a collaborative enterprise and, and one uh, that um, is worthy of the topic in the sense that it is a topic precisely, or an encyclical, uh, precisely about unity and about order. Uh, order in human affairs, unity in the human family in a variety of ways. Um, and an encyclical that, as you all know, was received 50 years ago with extraordinary, truly unprecedented acclaim, not merely in the Catholic community, uh, but in public life in general. In part, of course, because it's an encyclical that was very deliberately addressed to all men of goodwill and not merely to the Catholic faithful. So welcomed uh, in public that uh, even the New York Times printed the entirety of the encyclical, the first and only, I dare say, perhaps the last time. One might wonder what exactly the motives of the New York Times were in doing so, um, and, and, uh, and therefore the political and cultural context of the encyclical looms large in understanding why it was received the way that it was. But certainly, it sparked a great deal of hopefulness. Hopefulness precisely in a time of division, in a time of conflict, in the midst of the Cold War, in the emergence of the conflicts over decolonization and a variety of other threats, challenges to peaceful coexistence of the human family. And so it does need to be read, at least in important ways, situated in a historical context. As, of course, all documents of the Catholic social tradition must, uh, must also be read. Uh, Catholic social teaching always seeks to articulate certain enduring principles, understandings drawn from the experience of the human family and the wisdom of the church, and yet also always addresses the problems of the day and the signs of the times. And Pachimenteris is, of course, no exception. In any, in any, if, if anything, it is exactly a paradigmatic example of that combination. But that means, of course, that 50 years later, one is left wondering exactly how to disentangle what are the enduring principles? What are the lasting teachings and insights of the document? And what are the ways in which it is tied to a specific context that needs, let's say, some aggiornamento? Right? And so that is what brings us here tonight. And we're extraordinarily privileged to have four uh, exceptional scholars to help us begin to understand 
how pachamenteris might apply today. What is it that it introduced to our understanding of social affairs and the world that we need to recapture and renew? It was a challenge, this challenge of renewing always in every generation uh, the applicability of the teachings of Pachamenteris that was in fact already in the mind of John XXIII when he wrote it. One of the concluding passages of the encyclical is entitled Constant Endeavor. And this is what the Holy Father said. He said, we think it opportune to point out how difficult it is to understand clearly the relation between the objective requirements of justice and concrete situations. To define, that is, correctly to what degree and in what form doctrinal principles and directives must be applied in the given state of human society. The definition of these degrees and forms is all the more difficult in an age such as ours, driven forward by a fever of activity. If that was true 50 years ago, how much more true is it today? And yet, he continues, this is the age in which each one of us is required to make his own contribution to the universal common good. Daily is borne in on us the need to make the reality of social life conform better to the requirements of justice. Hence, our sons, our sons and daughters, have every reason for not thinking that they can relax their efforts and be satisfied with what they have already achieved. This last sentence for us is exactly the starting point, to not relax in the constant endeavor to ask how these principles of justice apply today. To help us, I'm uh, privileged first to introduce our principal speaker for this evening. His Excellency Archbishop Roland Minneroth is the Archbishop of Dijon, France, president of the French Bishops' Conference and a member of the Inter International Theological Commission, as well as of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. He was ordained in the Archdiocese of Strasbourg in 1978, was made Archbishop of Dijon in 2004. He holds doctorates in Catholic theology and canon law from the Pontifical Gregorian University, as well as the Faculty of Theology at Strasbourg, where he also taught church history and canon law. He served in the diplomatic service and in the Secretariat of State of the Holy See, and is best known for his many publications in the areas of social ethics, church history, and ecclesiastical law. Uh, commenting on Archbishop Minneroth's uh, presentation afterwards, and in the order in which they will be speaking, our first Professor Joseph Weiler, the Joseph Strauss Professor of Law and the European Union Jean Monnet Chair at New York University Law School, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also serves as the director of the Strauss Institute for the Advanced Study of Law and Justice, the Tikva Center for Law and Jewish Civilization, and the Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice. Among his many publications, all of them well known, are The Constitution of Europe and Una Europa Cristiana. As of this fall, Professor Weiler will become the new president of the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Next, uh, Russell Hittinger is the Warren Professor of Catholic Studies and Research and the Professor of Law at the University of Tulsa, also a member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, as well as the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aqu Aquinas. He's held professorships at the Catholic University of America, Princeton University, Fordham University, and New York University. His books include The First Grace, Rediscovering Natural Law in a Post-Christian Age, and A Critique of the New Natural Law Theory. Currently, he's at work on a book on the evolution of Catholic social theory and doctrine during the 19th and 20th centuries. Finally, but no means least, Professor Marianne Glendon, well known here at the University of Chicago to many of you, is the Learned Hand Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, president of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. You can see where we were drawing our guest list from tonight. She served as the US Ambassador from the, to the Holy See in 2008 and 2009, as well as two terms as a member of the US President's uh, Council on Bioethics. Professor Glendon is the author of many articles and books, but most recently, The Forum and the Tower, 
how scholars and politicians have imagined the world from Plato to Eleanor Roosevelt. Please join me in welcoming our guests this evening and welcoming Professor uh, Archbishop Minneroth to the podium. Thank you very much for your presentation. There is only one point which I need to correct. I am not president of the French uh, Conference of Bishops. Maybe you anticipate because we have, <laughs> we have elections next week. <laughs> <laughs> your eminences, your excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me first of all to extend my deep gratitude to His Eminence Cardinal Francis George and to Lumen Christi for their kind invitation to share with you some considerations on the occasion of Pacem Interis 50 years later. Pacem Interis can be considered as an epochal point of reference in the history of the social doctrine of the Church. It entails the richness of the past and opens new horizons with all the risks linked to such an operation. We must not forget that the times were ripe to welcome such a change. Was it a change or a simple development? This is a question of hermeneutics, breaking off or continuity. The paradigm of Vatican II applies also to parliamentaries. Pope Benedict strongly insisted that the teachings of Vatican II can only be interpreted and received with a hermeneutic of continuity. This should be the rule for all magisterial documents. Parliamentaries comes to light in a changing world with unrecorded economic and social development and general optimism, at least in the West. The hard after-war years were over, colonialism was ending in the South, the encyclical is full of such yearnings after more freedom, better life and hope for peace. Yet peace was less than anything guaranteed in the early 60s. The movement that merged into Vatican II is already at work in parliamentaries. The church should not miss the appointment with history. What was it about? The issue was not less than the reconciliation between the teachings of the church and the world the world, understood as the liberal democratic society stemming from the European Enlightenment and the American experiment. The challenge was not small. We all remember that Pius the, the IX in the syllabus had ruled out any possibility for the church to compose with the modern social philosophy the liberal and relativistic world. Parliamentaries tried to reconcile the modern individual with the order created by God. In the social teaching of the church, the accent was on the objective reality in which all creatures move. This order which is ultimately inscribed in the heart of the human beings, is an object of knowledge through reason. It is not static or immutable. What is immutable is God's design in creating an order that has to govern the relationship between human beings, human communities and nations. What is submitted to change is our knowledge of that order. Now, at the core of modern understanding of humanity in the universe, there is no notion of such an objective order. The entire accent is on the individual, his auto-realization, and as a correlate, 
auto-alienation in the hands of the state through a contract. There is no truth to be researched or achieved. There is only a consensus to be found among contractors to define what would be the norm to which all should obey in order to build an acceptable social framework. So my first question is, we are in research of convergence with the liberal thought. Modern times began with the Pax Westphalica, and certainly earlier, but 1648 is one of these milestones that sign a new beginning. The old world based on the evidence of an inherent order created by God was over. As Grotius puts it, we can organize the world etsi Deus non dareto as if God would not exist. God was still mentioned formally as a lip service, but he was no longer the God of the Jewish Christian revelation acting in history and guiding its course to an end decided by him alone. Now the course of history was in the hands of the strongest. Non veritas sed voluntas facit legem, said Hobbes. Not the truth, but human will makes the law. The 18th century enlightenment mixed easily the claims of the absolute state with those of the absolute individual. The Westphalian peace treaties opened a three centuries long era of unlimited state competence, including in ecclesiastical matters, not without a strong resistance of the Catholic Church. Each territory, its religion, was the rule in Europe. Relations among states were dictated by the law of the strongest. The first attempt to overcome the Westphalia regime was not the society of nations, which failed dramatically to implement its new paradigm. It was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, notable not least for its vision of universality and its high philosophical inspiration. What was new? The individual was not left alone. He was considered in his species. All human beings were considered as having the same inherent dignity. This was a move, a move towards the idea of an order governing all human persons. <coughs> and the most visible part of the change was that the state was no longer absolute. The states declared that they had no competence or authority upon the sphere of the inner liberty of the human person. The human rights philosophy defined the realm of individual freedom in matters of thought, conscience, religion, conviction, in matters of civil, social, and cultural rights. So the state became instrumental to the implementation of the rights of the person. 1948 was a Copernican revolution that could not leave the Catholic Church indifferent. The way in which the Universal Declaration was received and commented by the papal magisterium is indeed worth to be mentioned. Pius XII, recognizing the huge progress made by such a declaration, immediately pointed out the inherent weakness of the document, regretting that the human dignity mentioned in the text was not founded. The dignity grounded on nothing else that than itself so being subject to all future distortion or manipulation. Later, 
John the Twenty Third still made some reservations, but John Paul the Second qualified the Declaration as a milestone on the road of humanity. Can the two lines of interpretation converge, that of the Catholic Church and that of the, of the modern world? In the process of coming slowly together to the modern world and the culture of the human rights, Pacem in Terris plays a key role. In the social teaching of the Church, there is a before and an after Pacem in Terris, both in style and content in style. The rare novelty of the encyclical lays in its reception, it has been mentioned, by the media and world public opinion. It was a first. In 1963, the world was right in the midst of the Cold War, two years after the erection of the Berlin Wall but it was also right in the midst of decolonization and the cycle of economic growth and modernization with a certain euphoria concerning scientific and technical progress. The church itself was seeking her aggiornamento. John XXIII had convoked and opened the Second Vatican Council. His fatherly personality had won him a great deal of confidence in all circles. He had called for peace between the two blocs at the time of the recent Cuban Missile Crisis, October 62. He had just received the son-in-law of Khrushchev in the Vatican, and in the same year he was awarded the Borson Pro Peace Prize. John XXIII addressed his encyclical beyond the usual ecclesiastical recipients to all men of good will, according to an expression which is taken from the Bible in Luke 2. That enlarged the circle of its audience and disposed public opinion towards a favorable reception of parliamentaries. The well-chosen title gave rise to an immense surge of hope that the great cleavages dividing humanity could be overcome. This optimistic sentiment was shared in the West, while the people under Soviet domination found themselves deprived of their basic liberties. <clears throat> the encyclical adopted a language accessible to all categories of readers and avoids theological references. It aims to encourage reflection in favor of peace among persons of all religious and philosophical cre creeds. What is most striking is how little development the encyclical accords to the question of war. Peace. Peace is envision envisioned within a positive dynamic that fosters it and that presupposes the search for an order that is inscribed in human nature itself. Tranquillitas ordinis, according to the famous expression of St. Augustine, receives an especially rich treatment. Peace is not only the absence of war, the encyclical deals broadly with natural and universal social ethics. The more open and accessible style of the encyclical contributed to the fact that certain points of doctrine were attributed to the encyclical, which in reality were already part of the patrimony of the social doctrine of the Church. For example, the distinction among three powers in the operation of public authority in conformity with natural law. Its merit is thus to have made the social doctrine of the Church better known in doctrine. Before parliamentaries prevailed in the Church the doctrine that what is morally true has a right to be recognized as such while 
what is wrong could only be tolerated in order to avoid a major evil. Pachamintaris registered the move of the Catholic Church from the objective order to subjective rights, the latter being understood as the rights of the person within the order created by God. But the accent was passing from the order to the individual. This move was full of risks, as further developments demonstrated. Talking of rights of the subject was too close to the liberal discourse of individual rights not founded on an objective order. In its perspective, Pachamintaris did not move away from the traditional doctrine, but its new language created a situation of reciprocal misunderstanding. The liberal side was convinced that finally the Catholic Church relied the secular word. And the Catholics thought that they had indeed a common language with modern society. Hints at a transition from an objective concept of natural law to a subjective concept is already present in Pius XII's. Each human person is the bearer of rights by virtue, virtue of his nature. This accent on individual rights was explained by the need to reject collectivistic ideologies that conceive of right as originating only from the state. It was necessary to counteract those who claim that there is no man other than collective man, and that human nature resides in this abstraction. It was necessary to restore to the individual his quality of personhood, and thus of individual realization of human nature. Individuals, not the collective, are the original subjects of human rights. Behind these formulations lies a personalistic philosophy. The issue of collectivism was thus resolved, but not that of the very notion of right. The social discourse of the magisterium regularly affirms that human rights are derived from the human person. According to Pachamintaris number nine, I quote, each individual man is truly a person. He should say man or woman, but I quote, he is a nature that is endowed with intelligence and free will. As such, he has rights and duties which together flow as a direct consequence from his nature. These rights and duties are universal, inviolable, and therefore altogether inalienable. We must observe that rights are never considered separated from their counterpart, the duties. It seems that here there is a conflation of two philosophies that of the natural law and that of the person. The notion of the person is central in the encyclical, as it was in all the previous social doctrine. The encyclical draws human rights and duties from the fact that the human being is a person. So the encyclical seems to posit an equivalence between the notions of person and nature. The person or hypostasis of Christ exists in two natures. The hypothesis, hypostasis is a mode of personified existence. It is the same in the famous definition of Boetius, the person is an individual substance of 
a reasonable nature. The nature of the human person is specified by reason. Pachamintaris, which I quoted, employs the concept of nature where Boetius utilized that of individual substance. In effect, the same human nature is realized, that is to say, subsists in each person. The person is the individualization of rational nature. Human nature exists only in the individuals who realize it. It is modernity that understands natural rights as inherent in each individual. This shift bears on the notion of right. The affirmation requires now a treatment of the doctrine of natural law. This point is easy to grasp when the language makes a distinction between natural law, lex nature, and natural right, jus naturale. It is not the case, for instance, in German, and probably not so much in English. Hmm? Classical doctrine does not confuse natural right and natural law. The natural law does not change but our perception of natural law takes shape and evolves. The reference to a naturally just order is not to be confused with a search for consensus, which is always precarious, nor with the pure positivity of law, which is law only because it is imposed by force. Certainly, the encyclical says, I quote, the laws which govern men are to be sought where the father of the universe has inscribed them in man's nature. And that is where we must look for them there and nowhere else. The norms refer to an immutable <coughs> order inscribed in human beings which is known as the natural law. Natural law is the order created by God. Yes, the person has natural rights, rights that one can claim on the basis of one's dignity, but these rights have their source in the measure of what is due, a measure anterior to this dignity, a measure that the Creator has determined and that is inscribed in the order created by Him, a measure that we call natural right. So natural right is the measure inscribed in the order created by God. The classical doctrine considers the most telling example of a distinction between natural law and natural right is that of the inviolable right to life, a right that has been relativized whoever, however, in the cases of legitimate defense or, or the action of killing within the framework of a just war. It must therefore be said, man has an innate natural right to life to the extent that this is naturally just. St. Thomas interpreted the fifth commandment in this way, I quote, thou shalt not unjustly take the life of another person. The just measure is to be sought in interpersonal relations. Right is set forth on the basis of a just relationship between persons. So between natural law and natural or natural order on the one side and natural rights on the other side, a link has to be established. A human person is entitled to invoke rights because he or she is endowed with a dignity 
which is a source of rights. But such a title belongs to the ontology of the person, to her human nature. When one comes to vindicate his or her rights, we pass to the sphere of human relations in society. Only when there is no recognized fundament to human rights can rights be deduced immediately from the fact of being a person. But in the case of the Catholic teaching, it is more than clear that rights are second to entitlement and need a contextual mediation in order to be claimed and implemented. In the enumeration of rights that flow from human nature, the encyclical proposes for the first time a formulation of individual liberty of conscience and religion. I quote, among men's, again, rights, is that of being able to worship God in accordance with the right dictates of his own conscience and to profess his religion both in private and in public. This expression could be understood in St. Thomas' senses as objectively true conscience or in the subjective sense following Suarez as conscience which believes itself to be in truth. Two citations follow from Lactantius and Pope Leo XIII, who claimed the necessary liberty of the act of faith. This affirmation is close to that of Pacem in Terris, which speaks of the right to freedom in investigating the truth. Pius XI had already claimed the liberty of consci consciences, plural, against the totalitarian state, but without speaking of liberty of conscience, singular. And Pius XII, in his 1942 Crucius uh, message, had included the right to worship God in public and private among the fundamental rights. Did this proposition constitute a change in relation to the celebrated statement of Pius XII in his discourse, Chiriesche of December 53, where he, he upheld the traditional doctrine that error could only be tolerated, but it could not be recognized as a right. Pacheminteris gathers the heritage of the popes, who since Leo XIII, have emphasized fundamental liberties of the person in relation to totalitarian regimes. Freedom of religion, an expression which would only appear with Paul VI and the Declaration Dignitatis Humanae of Vatican II, is a space of immunity in relation to all power external to the person. The natural right envisaged here is that which would be defined by Vatican II as the right not to be impeded in religious matters. <coughs> Neither John XXIII nor Vatican II innovated on that point. Leo XIII had already recognized the freedom of conscience I quote, in the sense that man within the state has the right to follow the will of God according to the knowledge of his duty and to fulfill its precepts without anything impeding him. The council would explain that the liberty to believe or not to believe is a liberty oriented towards the truth not a capacity to make arbitrary choices. We know that Vatican, the Vatican II Declaration on, Hum on Religious Freedom was one of the most discussed documents of the Council. 
after having described the legal structure of this human right as established in the international instruments, the text goes on saying twice that this understanding of religious freedom fits with the Catholic doctrine and that it fulfills the requirements of the freedom of the church in its relationship with the states. <coughs> we witness 50 years after that the secular and the Catholic line of interpretation do not necessarily converge. Another theme that crosses the encyclical had a tremendous impact on the years after Vatican II. I mean the importance given to what the encyclical calls the signs of time. The notion of sign of time, which would reappear in Gaudium et Spes, was an uncommon formulation. It was strongly emphasized in the media and interpreted as a sort of rallying cry to modernity, which was an error to believe that. The fourth parts of the encyclical conclude indeed with the reading of the signs of the time. Order among human beings, order within, within each political community, order among political communities, and order in the world community. Among these signs of the times were cited the advancement of the working classes, the advancement of women, the advancement of peoples who had been colonized, the affirmation of the rule of law state and of democratic procedures, the regulation of conflicts by negotiation, the conviction that war was no longer a means of obtaining justice for the violation of rights. And finally, the creation of the United Nations was hailed and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was saluted as a step towards the establishment of a legal political organization of the world community. With optimism, these promising developments were interpreted as signs of progress toward a greater respect for the dignity of the person and the natural moral order. The reference to the signs of the times is one of the hallmarks of the whole encyclical and its dynamic conception of the natural order. The natural order is a given in the sense that it is inscribed in beings, but it is also something to be realized. It assumes the dimension of time, the progress of consciences, and the collective will. Nature is perceived through the manifold of human history. It calls for discernment. Nature in parliamentaries is not merely essential, it is also existential. Fifty years after parliamentaries, we still face the question, the question of word governance. The encyclical attracted the attention of the international community with its uncommon insistence on the necessity of a global authority. Uh, the Papal Academy for Social, uh, Social Sciences dedicated a study to this theme in the, its nine plenary session in May 2003. The encyclical says, today the universal common good presents us with problems which are worldwide in their dimensions. Problems, therefore, which cannot be solved except by a public authority with power, organization, and means coextensive with these problems and with a worldwide sphere of activity. Consequently, the moral order itself demands the establishment of some such general form of public authority." End of quotation. This reasoning is consistent with the doctrine of the common good. When the common good has a universal dimension, as in the case when it concerns the preservation of peace among nations, 
it is necessary to have an authority that is capable of effectively promoting it. The encyclical specifies that this global authority, I quote, cannot be imposed by force. It must be set up with the consent of all nations. End of quotation. It ought to protect the rights of the person to be governed by the principle of subsidiarity. Pius XII had already spoken of these hopes for a world of authority. The encyclical, however, gives an explicit recognition to the United Nations. After the rise of the absolutist state, and particularly in the wake of the treaties of Westphalia, the Holy See unceasingly referred to the existence of a human community founded on the law of nations, as expounded by authors like Victoria, Vittoria Suarez or Grotius. It was only after f the First World War that the, pri the principle of a binding international order for the resolution of conflicts resurfaced. Benedict XV the fifteenth had insisted on the institution of a permanent arbiter that would be endowed with the power of sanctioned states, to sanction states. At the end of the Second World War, Pius XII expressed the wish that the new organization of the United Nations would be given sufficient authority to guarantee peace and prevent all aggression. The critique of the unlimited authority of the nation state was reinforced by Pius XII. By an authority of universal jurisdiction, John XXIII understood an authority for arbitration of conflicts between states and of supervision under international law. He did not pronounce himself in favor of something like a word government, but rather for a regulatory authority in international relations. The hope for a general authority equipped with a worldwide power, as the encyclical says, is accompanied in Pacha Militaris by three conditions to be observed. First, this authority should result from a unanimous agreement and not be imposed by force. It should not be at the service of the most powerful nations and their interests. Legal and moral equality of political communities is a principle of justice. All are equal in natural dignity. Secondly, the universal common good is defined in reference to the human person. It should have for its special aim the recognition, respect, safeguarding and promotion of the rights of the human person. A global authority thus should create the conditions for the respect of the rights of the human person at all levels. Thirdly, <coughs> the exercise of such a global authority should be governed by the principle of subsidiarity. In conformity with this principle, it should only intervene in order to supplement the insufficiency of national powers for the resolution of problems that have a global dimension. There is thus no question of charging the encyclical with the irrational desire to create a universal political power, rather than an effective service for peace. Finally, one is struck by what could be called the optimistic appreciation by the encyclical <coughs> of the role of the forces of evil at work in the world. Pachamenteris invites to make a distinction, I quote, between error 
as such, and the person who falls into error, even if the case of men who err regarding the truth or are led astray as a result of their inadequate knowledge in matters either of religion or of the highest ethical standard. The encyclical also suggests a distinction between false ideologies and the historical movements that carry them. Whereas, whereas the first are fixed, the second can evolve. These formulations could have seemed extremely complacent about the totalitarian regimes, which at the time were oppressing a good portion of humanity. Nothing permitted the sort in 1963 <coughs> that these historical movements were susceptible of evolution and that 36 years later they would collapse. Under the pontificate of Paul VI, with the participation of Archbishop Casaroli, what is called the Ostpolitik of the Holy See had to confront regimes determined to make Christianity and the Church dis disappear. One can therefore credit the optimist John XXIII and uh, one of the writers of the encyclical, Monsignor Pavan, with the prescient idea that communist regimes would finish by dissolving. In opening the council, John XXIII had proclaimed his complete disagreement with the prophets of doom, who announced catastrophes as if the world was nearing its end. And he invited recognition of the mysterious designs of divine providence in the course of events. The world gave such a positive reception to this encyclical because it had the feeling that the church was finally meeting its expectations. We certainly need prophets in order to help us discern the crimson thread of the history of salvation that runs through human history. Fifty years after its publication, Parchamentaris indicates to us the course to be maintained in a global world that has changed, but still calls for care and love. The Church continues to share the deep aspirations of humanity, but not the solutions of relativistic ideologies. As a conclusion, Parchamentaris opened an era of hope which was then amplified by Vatican II, what kind of hope? That modern society would give attention to the Catholic teaching, and that the Catholic teaching would join the expectations of modernity. Fifty years after Parchamentaris, we have left the shores of after-war modernity and have entered into a quite different cultural, social, and political environment in which the Christian roots, at least for Europe, are forgotten if not denied. There is no longer any likeliness that church and society have a common language on basic issues in matters of anthropology, understanding of marriage, of common good, of education of children, of freedom of religion. The world has split into cultural and national turning in oneself. Widely spread anti-humanistic ideologies like deep ecology are threatening the common understanding of the meaning of human beings among other creatures. In a word, it appears that there can be no convergence where the fundamental anthropological references exclude each other. We are now aware that the applause of the world to the church statements is an ambiguous sign, if not a sign of assured reciprocal misunderstanding. As Pope Francis has put it, in one 
of his first speech is, when the cross is absent in it, the discourse of the church does no longer differ from that of an OGN. It dilutes itself in worldliness. This was certainly not the aim of Pacem Interis, which was able to expose the Catholic understanding of moral order to this world as world. Exactly as 50 years ago, the position of the church should be recognizable, like the city visible on the hilltop, Matthew 5, unmistakably identified as a sign of contradiction for all those who do not care that, I quote the psalm, that in vain do its builders toil if the Lord does not build the house. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make four or five really discreet points about the encyclical, and uh, they will not match either the profundity or the broad range that we've just heard. So my first comment, I if there's anybody in the room that hasn't gone and reread Pachim and Terrace, you owe it to yourself to do it because it's a remarkable document and it's a remarkable document because it, there's a lot of it that remains fresh and relevant and quite astonishing. But here's the astonishing thing. I often wonder about the short life of most papal encyclicals. Uh, 13 or 14 years ago when I was writing A Christian Europe, I read all papal encyclicals from Reum Novarum onwards. It's not such a huge task. Uh, uh, I don't know, Pius uh, Twelfth wrote 41 and Leo XIII, 85. Uh, but then pa Paul VI only wrote six, and Leo XII only four, and until Pachim and Teres, they used to be quite short, so it's actually not such a huge task to read them all. But I remember the experience in reading them and a certain embarrassment towards myself. How, how can I be somebody who holds myself to be educated and cultured never done this before, and never expose myself to the richness of these papal encyclicals. Now, they're not all of the same cloth. Uh, some of Pius X uh, are <laughs> quite jarring to read today. But uh, most of them, and I will explain in a minute how I suggest one should read an encyclical, including Pacham and Terrace, are really mind-expanding experiences. And then to my surprise, I, I discovered that most people had not read them. And with the exception of a few iconographic encyclicals like Rerum Novarum, etc. And the only explanation I can give is that their life depends on the papacy in which they are given. And very quickly, a loyalty is developed towards the new pope. And the one previous is still remembered because the popes in their encyclicals, and this is a pattern that you will see throughout all of them. So John the Twenty-Third mostly cites Pius the Twelfth. So each pope cites mostly the pope before him. And then the others sort of fade into a kind of oblivion. And all I want to comment is that that is such a great loss and so sad because there is really a richness uh, and a timeli timeliness to them that is just lost by the cycle, uh, speaking from the outside of the church. So that's my first comment. And it's uh, evoked simply by the, ex the experience of rereading this encyclical and being struck by its freshness 50 years later. So uh, my second comment. So how does one read an encyclical? 
the, the, all of them, all of them have a certain uh, constant. On the one hand, they are very much creatures of the period of the epoch in which they are written. And it's quite interesting. If you read an encyclical from the beginning of the 20th century, it's the smell of the beginning of the 20th century. And when you read Pachem in Terrace, it really evokes in you the kind of, or re-evokes in some of us, those feelings of the height of the Cold War and the fears and tension and rearmament and uh, Armageddon and all that. So in some respects, they're very much a reflection of the epoch in which they is written. But at the same time, uh, there is a timelessness to them. You read in each one of them, or practically in each one of them, and certainly in the important affirmations and reflections that could be written at any time and are relevant in 1900 or 2000 or 2013. And it's the interplay between the two of those uh, that characterize the encyclical and give it its richness. Uh, what is my reading of the best? When are they the most impactful? In the sense of when do they resonate most? And uh, Pachem in Terrace is an example of that. It's when, on the one hand, it's not just a reflection of the time it's written in, but addresses problems and issues that society and people feel deeply. In other words, that it's not uh, the pastor or the priest or the rabbi in the pulpit droning on and somehow people say, this does not affect my life, but it really resonates with the anxieties and the fears or the hopes and aspirations that characterize people in their actual existence. So that's condition number one. And then when the Catholic Church, in my view, is at its best, it's when the answers it gives are not the expected one. In other words, when, again, speaking as an outsider, uh, when you say to yourself, these Christians are really onto something. Uh, uh, here's a perspective that you don't come across uh, elsewhere. And I want to illustrate this now uh, with uh, Pachem and Terrace. Uh, so first, uh, all the vogue in the early 60s was human rights. And the covenants were about to be finished and signed in 1966, etc. cetera. And uh, I'm a, a student of human rights and the 60s are all full of human rights and you get doctorates with human rights and uh, the Archbishop mentioned it. What is so striking and so countercultural and so unexpected and remains fresh and relevant today because we still live in the culture of rights, it's that it gives equal space and weight to duties. If you take, for example, the citizenship clause of the European Union, it says nationals of the member states are citizens of the European Union. They enjoy all the rights and the duties that the treaties bestow. And then there's a long list of rights and not a single duty mentioned. We really have forgotten the culture of duty and personal responsibility. So on the one hand, it's with it. It's a creature of its time. Rights are at the center. And on the other hand, it is really quite different from any other rights discourse that is going on at that time in the early 60s because it's not just an odd line, the centrality that it gives to duties and responsibility. And if I had more time, I would explain why this is important, but I think people in this room will understand uh, that. Uh, I, I will give you an example from the field of international law. So, again, it's, as the Archbishop mentioned, it's very optimistic and very hopeful. 
and in some way that's what we expect from a pastor. When people are afraid, one expects some message of hope. But I want to show you how different and ahead of its time it is in its grasp of international law, circa early 1960s. So uh, if anybody is taking notes, it's in paragraphs 80, 86 to 89. So we have the traditional statement about the importance of equality, equality of states, and that's a staple of public international law, sovereign equality, all states are equal in dignity, etc. But uh, now, now come uh, two shockers, which are totally alien to international legal discourse. The second value that the encyclical mentions is honor. Uh, in the modern, honor doesn't play a role. It's all about power and money and advantage and interest analysis. It is so surprising, refreshing, interesting, and relevant because when you start thinking about it, the fact of the matter is that states and societies are hugely different by considerations of honor not losing honor, acting honorably, and it's the extension of the notion of dignity to the collectivity and to the state. It's novel, it's interesting. And then comes something that, again, is way ahead of its time. In public international law, we only begin to see it in force in the 70s and 80s. 1960s public international law is a liberal in the good sense of the word, it's about coexistence. It's about a world riven by strife and trying to find rules of mutual respect which will allow states to pursue their national interest without impinging unduly on the national interest of others. And finding rules of coordination in a world of individual states, each one of them has the right in dignity and equality to pursue their national interest. It's a liberal paradigm of public international law. And then the shocker of this encyclical, because unabashedly it introduces from its discussion of intra-society, of national societies, it takes it to the international realm. And today it's a commonplace, but I assure you that in the early 60s, this was revolutionary and radical when it talks about the common good of humanity as a whole. And it introduces a, a communitarian paradigm of public international law and says that the purpose of public international law is not to pursue, allow states to pursue their national interests without impinging on the national interest of others. But there is such a thing that today we all the time talk about when we talk about intergenerational and environmental and common heritage of mankind. All that is speak that is unfamiliar in the early 60s in the height of the Cold War, and it anticipates the communitarian paradigm of public international law, which is now a commonplace. Now, uh, there is a kind of naive belief in my view, the Vatican seems so attached to a belief in the uh, potential and power of the institutions of the United Nations. The United Nations is very important, and we should not dismiss it. We should not exaggerate its potential, etc. But one thing, again, that Pachem and Terrace does that nobody is doing then. Nobody is doing then. And yet today it is common speak of public international law. It's to understand the interdependence governance gap. In other words, to really highlight with precision, there are problems that are beyond the resolution of any individual state, and yet the international community does not have the institutions and mechanisms to resolve them collectively. How we do it, whether it's the United Nations, other multilateral systems, regional organizations, global administrative law, all the mechanisms that today are discussed so much is a different issue. But it is remarkable how clearly and with precision they put their finger on the problem that needed solution, the interdependence governance gap. In other words, problems, I repeat, 
that no individual state can solve on their own, simply because they transcend environmental problems, etc. And yet, the international community simply has not got the institutions to do it. So, that's my third point to say to you again, the problem it addresses resonates because everybody is worried at that time. To a much greater degree than we are able to remember even today. How concerned, you know, the sort of Armageddon scenario was, etc. And yet it comes up with answers or diagnoses or solutions or illuminations that are not uh, typical. That, as I said, it really comes from a different type of sensibility and consciousness. I'm going to skip one point and come to the last point, which I think is hugely important today, uh, maybe even more than then. And this time I'm going to actually read the passage. This is the point where the Pope turns to our sons. In other words, having addressed the world, he turns to our sons. That's most of you who are sitting here. And uh, tries to explain what is our son's duty in addressing these problems. And he says, in traditional Christian states at the present time, this is 1963, civil institutions evince a high degree of scientific and technical progress and possess abundant machinery for the attainment of every kind of objective. And yet it must be owned that these institutions are often but slightly affected by Christian motives and, Christ and a Christian spirit. One may well ask the reasons for this since the men who have largely contributed and who are still contributing to the creations of these institutions are men, and we should add women, who are professed Christians and who live their lives, at least in part, in accordance with the precepts of the Gospels. In our opinion, the explanation lies in a certain cleavage between faith and practice. Their inner spiritual unity must be restored so that faith may be the light and love, the motivating force of all their actions. This is in 63, but it sort of reads not totally irrelevant to what we find today. And I want to explain why right now I think this me message of 63 is particularly poignant. Uh, one of the huge legacies of Benedict, and in my view, his great speeches before Westminster or Regensburg or the Bundestag will resonate perhaps more than his encyclicals. And that's not to, in any way, to diminish from the encyclicals. And probably the most important is the sort of road between Regensburg and uh, the Bundestag. It's a very authoritative reply to Rawls because basically the Pope says, uh, yes, there has to be a common language in the public space and it's the language of reason and to that extent I'm Rawlsian. Uh, but he gets it wrong at least by lumping all religions together because he misunderstands Christianity because when Christianity steps into the public space and speaks normatively, it speaks the language of reason and does not speak the language of revelation. Of course, all that is already incipient in uh, the Second Vatican Council, but he articulates it in such a sharp and courageous, and the places he articulates it, that it's thrilling and for many people energizing and empowering and liberating. One can step into the public sphere and unabashedly uh, participate in that public sphere because when the Christian steps into the public sphere and demands, makes normative demands on the public sphere, he or she are speaking the language of reason and they cannot be dismissed, well, you are just a Christian, you have no place here. So now I come back to and these were my last words to, to um, John the 23rd. 
So it's hugely important what Benedict has done, and it had to be done, and it's great that it was said, etc. But it carries with it a certain danger that when the Christian steps into the public sphere, he or she only talk the language of reason, which is the common vocabulary. And they think that this new passport and this visa is the passport and visa with which they have to present themselves in the public sphere. And the danger is that we won't have enough of Christians who speak in step into the public sphere and say, I'm actually speaking as a Christian, and here is a religious sensibility which I want you to listen to because it illuminates a problem in a different way. I have taught for 30 years. I was a professor at Michigan Law School for 10 years, at Harvard Law School for 10 years, and at NYU now for 10 years. And in 30 years, only once did a student, not a Jew and not a Catholic, I'm afraid, a Christian evangelical at Harvard Law School, say in class, Professor, can I present to the class what a Christian evangelical would think about this problem? It was stunning. The courage was stunning, but the sensibility was stunning. It's precisely the fact that he was not saying, here is the disembodied voice of reason on which everybody could agree. He was saying, here is a sensibility that I bring from the Christian tradition, which I think is important to hear because it might shape the way you will think about this problem. And I think that is why I find that last passage I read from uh, Pachem in Terrace so important that with all the universality, etc., one should not lose both the uniqueness and distinctness and the courage to step up and say, here I am a Catholic and I have certain sensibilities as a Catholic which are not shared by others and those are also important to be heard in our public discourse, roles notwithstanding. Thank you very much. My thanks to Archbishop Minaroth for teaching us how to read Pacham and Terrace. And great appreciation to you, Professor Weiler, a Jewish scholar is teaching us how to read Catholic social doctrine. That's <laughs> quite remarkable. With regard to this unexpected Microphone. aspect, Microphone. sorry, with regard to this, you have to go really close. <coughs> Pretend you're Madonna. <laughs> Living in the material world, but it's not all. Thank you. Put it on the stand. I've got it. On the theme mentioned by Professor Weiler of patient reading of these encyclicals reveals all sorts of unexpected things. I want to begin with one unexpected note about Pacham and Terrace. Perhaps it comes as a surprise that the good Pope, John, uh, a giornamento progressive, had a deep and abiding interest in St. Augustine. For example, uh, in the middle of World War II, on the Feast of Christ the King, October 1942, when he was the apostolic delegate to Turkey and Greece, he made a retreat in Istanbul. His retreat master was the Jesuit father, René Follette, who preached on the image of a perfect bishop according to Isidore of Seville. And Archbishop Roncalli wrote in his diary that night, I quote, the bishop must be distinguished by his own understanding and his adequate explanation to others of the philosophy of history, even the history that is now, the history which before our eyes is adding pages of blood to the pages of political and social disorders. I want to reread St. Augustine's City of God and to draw from his doctrine 
the necessary material to form my own judgment, unquote. And so it was in Istanbul during the Second World War, while reflecting on the problem of nationalism and on the bishop as an image of the supranationalism of the church, Roncalli resolved to reread St. Augustine's City of God. And it gave birth to a pattern of themes in his own mind that bore fruit almost exactly 20 years later. It was in December 1962, the fourth year of his pontificate that Pope John, having learned that he had a serious cancer, assembled a drafting committee for a new encyclical, which would be called Pacem in Terris. And he typed the following instruction to Monsignor Pavan at the Lateran, what he wanted the encyclical to be about. It's remarkably brief, but very revealing. Pope John wrote, peace is the tranquility of order ordered obedience and fidelity to the eternal law. Order is giving each thing its place. The peace of mankind is ordered harmony in the home, in the city, and in man himself. Wretched, therefore, is the people alienated from God. The entire encyclical was assembled out of those three sentences. And of course, these three sentences are the Pope's paraphrase of Book 19 of St. Augustine's City of God. Peace is the tranquility of order. Just as a side note, I think John XXIII references St. Augustine more than any modern pope. If you go and read the entirety of his encyclicals and addresses, it's peppered with quotations and allusions to St. Augustine. Now, We've already heard that this is an important moment with regard to the Catholic tradition reconciling itself uh, to the modern human rights movement. And in Pacem and Terris, there are 25 discrete rights. But what's most important in the Catholic side of the reconciliation is the Pope's use of St. Augustine. Because the 25 rights are not just a list but are interwoven according to six modes of order. Uh, let's call them not just the tranquility of order, but six tranquilities of order. And to my knowledge, Pacem and Terris is the only human rights document of the era that explicitly takes the approach of contextualizing rights in a complex, ever more complex set of orders. The encyclical teaches that peace is multi-layered, order in the universe, by which he does not simply mean order of creation physically, but an order that includes the human person as a knower of that order. Order in freedom and conscience that flows from our participation in the eternal law. Order among individual human beings. Order between members of a political community and its own authorities order between political communities, and order that ought, ob ought to obtain between all individual social groups and states to a worldwide community. Peace is the ensemble of all of these tran tranquilities of order. And here, I certainly agree with Archbishop Minoroth. These orders are both given and dynamic. The encyclical makes this clear. In fact, every higher and greater order requires more practical intelligence and wisdom because they're open-ended. So for example, the first two orders, relationship of the intellect to the external order of nature, and then the relationship of the intellect to fundamental moral principles, are grasped rather spontaneously by exercising our nature, as it were. But those last two orders, order between political communities and order of a global common good test the creativity of human practical reason. I mean, even when there is good will, these orders are extremely difficult to achieve and to maintain. We could say they are always a work in progress. And here I think Archbishop Minoroth is entirely correct. These orders however they are given and inscribed in our nature, 
need to be achieved. That is, they don't come completely fully assembled without human understanding and experience and judgment, what the archbishop called the existential level. But the encyclical also argues that what is given and what is dynamic have to be kept together. For if there are natural rights, then there is order prior to and distinct from the orders that we construct. And thus the importance of the word endowed throughout the encyclical. It's a key principle. Endowment implies order, not merely a subjective claim or evaluation. So does the word dignity. The word dignity implies order, that is, a certain ranking of preeminence with respect to other things. Dignity is not just a claim. It's something that's set apart. Made unto the image and likeness of God, the encyclical says, basically paraphrasing uh, St. Thomas here, the dignity of a rational animal is the ability to be provident for oneself and for others. There's something given, but something to be perfected. So this unity of rights as claims and rights as right order have their source in exactly the same anthropology. It will not do to have an anthropology for one, for good order, and a different anthropology for subjective claims. That would be disastrous. And I think what John the 23rd and his encyclical team writing this understood way ahead of time was that was the sore spot of the interaction between the church and the human rights movement. That is, not two anthropologies, but one complexly related to issues of order and to subjective claims. Let me conclude, I have more, many more things to say, but I want to conclude that 1963 is the year of two letters. Pachamenteris was issued on April 11th, and five days later, on 16 April, Dr. Martin Luther King posted his letter from Birmingham jail. And I think it was a sign of those times, or at least the Christian engagement with those times, that letters from a pope and a Baptist minister could explicitly quote St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas for the natural law foundations of human law. And what's more, even more important, the pope and Dr. King could cite Augustine and Aquinas of the superiority of natural law, or the foundation of natural law to human law without having to face the objection that they were importing religiously sectarian beliefs into public discourse. Both of these letters were very favorably received. We've come a long way in 50 years since the, that year of two letters. The task of John the 23rd and Dr. King was not to question the foundations, the natural law foundations of order in human rights. The question of 1963 was how to make them effective in human institutions, both domestic and international. It's really interesting to go back and read Letter from Birmingham Jail. Dr. King did not feel the need to argue about the existence of human dignity and certain rights that follow upon it. Dr. King, like John the 23rd, appealed to those foundations. He didn't engage in a disputed question about them, he simply appealed to them. Dr. King's challenge was not the philosophical or theological foundations, his challenge was what he called Southern moderates, mostly white, but some blacks as well, who agreed, of course these principles are true, but it's not time to abolish legal uh, segregation. Similarly, John the 23rd appeals to the principles of human dignity and certain rights that follow upon it, and urges, well, has an urgency of the implementation of it. 50 years later, 
appeals to the anthropological foundations that were mentioned by Archbishop Minorov are themselves the disputed issue. The disputed issue is not effectuating them. But whether they exist to be effectuated. Now, of course, today, adoption of human rights in human laws happens every day. And rights are multiplied for legal and political purposes. But as this takes place, it seems to take place in inverse proportion to the anthropological evidence itself, which has become less and less accessible for purposes of public discourse. And indeed, it's somewhat difficult to imagine Blessed John XXIII's marvelously nuanced six modes of order, his beautiful reworking of St. Augustine. Imagine the city of God being reworked for the human rights movement. But there it is in Pacham and Terrace. It's hard to imagine today this winning any significant consensus for organizing the 25 rights that are in that encyclical, much less 25 additional ones. These anthropological propositions are just too disputable. Perhaps best left to public opinion. That is, we will have no anthropology at all. Whatever anthropological suppositions have to be made for legal or political purposes regarding human rights will be privately supplied. So we don't have a single anthropology that's diverse, open-ended, able to be applied at different points of historical time in different places, but simply a multiplication of anthropo anthropologies privately. This is an important change 50 years later. And, well, the space of less than two generations, even on the supposition of goodwill, trying to heal that rift, to put modes of order and anthropological foundations back together with human rights is going to test the mettle of every polity on Earth. I think I'll conclude on that note. As I listen to these presentations by my colleagues, I'm beginning to think that maybe part of the enduring fascination of Pachamanteras is simply its power to speak to so many different people and to elicit such fruitful reflections. Even now, uh, 50 years later, it stimulates people in quite different ways, remembering different things about the epoch in which it was written and reflecting on what it means for us today. Now, I think I am one of perhaps the few people in this room who actually remembers what Archbishop Minerath describes about the reception of Pachamanteras in 1963. I was here at the University of Chicago, and in fact, I still have my 1963 <laughs> copy of Pachamanteras. <laughs> 50 cents. <laughs> 50 cents, and with notes by none other than the great John Courtney Murray. I think this is a collector's item. Um, I remember uh, very well what Archbishop Minarath describes as uh, the kind of paradox that Pacham and Terrace in many ways didn't innovate at all. And yet, you said it was a first. It was an event, or as we used to say in the 60s, a happening. Uh, what was it? Well. To, to show you, uh, to give you a sense of just how much a happening it was. Robert Maynard Hutchins, uh, famed here in this university, uh, but in 1963 he had already gone to the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. Robert Maynard Hutchins organized a seminar on Pachamanteras at the United Nations. And it was attended by 22 Hundred 
scholars and statespersons. Names uh, that some of you will remember, Yu Thant, the uh, Secretary General of the UN, Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey, uh, Abba Iban, George Kennan, uh, Paul Tillich was there, everybody was there, <laughs> and the names that were, all the big names, 2,200, and the editor of Pravda was there. Dozens of reporters were there. Uh, now, this impression that Pachamenteris made in non-Catholic circles in itself made quite an impression on us young Catholics. Uh, we were impressed that they were impressed. Uh, and so uh, we asked ourselves, what was it? We asked our friends, our non-Catholic friends, what was it about this? And in the wonderful way of Pacham and Terrace of speaking to different people and awakening different kinds of sensibilities, you heard all kinds of answers. But I would say the answer that I heard most often from my friends here at the University of Chicago was it made a special impression on them that it was addressed to all men and women of goodwill. Now, I've added women as other people did, but I really think the reading in 1963 would have been, as Eleanor Roosevelt always said, whenever she heard expressions like that, she understood men to include women, and I think we could uh, to think of it that way. So it impressed us that it made a big impression on non-Catholics, but for young Catholics, who were beginning to be active in the civil rights movement here, it made a huge impression. We've spoken or we've, we've heard it mentioned that of course this was an encyclical that came at the height of the Cold War and uh, to many people that was the chief uh, emotion, that the, the fear and tension of the time that uh, was engaged. But for many of us in the United States, it was something else. We were here in 1963 when momentous changes were beginning to take rise in our society. And uh, for us, it was hugely exciting that the Pope was writing about our preoccupations in such a way as to give encouragement to us. He said, uh, Racial discrimination can in no way be accepted. He affirmed women's rights in contemporary society. He praised the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All of those things gave us the sense of being on the cusp of great historical changes, and we were so proud that our church's leaders were in the forefront. Don't forget that a year earlier, uh, uh, Archbishop Rummel in New Orleans had courageously excommunicated three powerful politicians in New Orleans for refusing to go along with the segregate, desegregation of the Catholic schools. So it felt like a great time to be a Catholic. Now, uh, I, I listened to all these wonderful presentations and I thought, what can I add to this? <laughs> and I think only a few remarks about the convergence and div divergence between the discourse of human rights that was initiated by the Universal Declaration and Human Rights in 1948 and the uh, discourse of human rights that appears in Pachem and Terrace. Um, for every one of us folks who was excited by the fact that the Pope was talking about human rights. There were others who were nervous, who were made nervous. Uh, they wondered where it would lead. They saw, as, as Archbishop Minarath said, that there were risks involved. There were, it might even be full of risks. So on the one hand, uh, there was this nervousness. On the other hand, there was the excitement. But if you look at the text of the Universal Declaration, side by side with Rerum Novarum and Quadragesimo Anno, you can see that the, um, many of the rights, not all, but many of the rights in the Universal Declaration were actually derived in haec verba from 
language that you find in Rerum Novarum and Quadragesimo Anno. And how did that happen? It was because the Universal Declaration's drafters were looking at the rights instruments that existed at the time, and many of these rights instruments had been drafted with the influence of Christian social and Christian democratic parties whose platforms had been influenced by the words of Leo XIII and Pius XI. In other words, the rights tradition into which uh, John XXIII had tapped was the dignity-based tradition, the personalist tradition, that Catholic social doctrine had already done a good deal to shape. And that tradition, as Cardinal Avery Dulles once put it, was a tradition that was not based on Lockean empiricism or on individualism. Cardinal Dulles couldn't resist a certain snootiness, adding that ours has a much more ancient and distinguished pedigree. <laughs> well, what I'm suggesting is that John XXIII was not really um, embracing wholeheartedly the modern language of rights. Uh, and of course, a careful no reader of Pacham and Terrace will notice that he says at a certain point about the Universal Declaration, wonderful document, but certain reservations were expressed, and rightly so, he says. He didn't spell out what reservations uh, he approved of, but in 1965, when the Fathers of the Vatican Council expressed a similar appreciation for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and human rights movements in Gaudium et Spes, they warned against thinking, I quote, that our personal rights are fully insured only when we are exempt from every requirement of divine law, if, end quote. If we do that, they said, we are headed down a path that leads not to the maintenance of the dignity of the human person, but its annihilation. Well, over the years, as we all know, the Catholic Church has deepened its engagement with the post-World War II human rights project, but it has always been with this alternation between offering support and encouragement for what it found worthy of supporting and encouraging, but always calling attention to and criticizing developments that seemed to put in jeopardy human dignity. So in that connection, I, I, I just have, in view of our venue today, I have to mention that uh, a similar warning about the moral risks of the venture was expressed by the great University of Chicago philosophy professor, Richard McKeon, who with Jacques Maritain served on a UN committee that was formed to assist the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, although he and Maritain and the others agreed that there was some basis for thinking that uh, the work should go forward and that there could be some values that were universal, he predicted with remarkable prescience. In the future, he said, there would be difficulties arising from the uses that might be made of a declaration of human rights for the purposes of advancing special interests. That was 1947. At the time, that must have seemed like a remote possibility. Uh, at the time, the danger would have <coughs> seemed whether the human rights idea or a human rights instrument could get any traction at all, uh, not whether it would be misused. But McKeon was right. No sooner did the rights idea begin to show its power, and it really did show its power as a reference point for the nonviolent movements that led to the collapse of totalitarian regimes in Eastern Europe, the end of apartheid in South Africa, no sooner did the human rights movements begin to show their power no, uh, than, sure enough, all sorts of interest groups began to try to capture and harness that power to various agendas. And the vision that uh, animated many of those uh, enterprises was very different from the vision that animated John the 23rd. In fact, the very parts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that most resembled 
rerum novarum and quadragesimo anno, the parts relating to motherhood, marriage, the family, the rights of parents uh, with respect to the education of their children, all of those came under attack. And the vision behind those attacks was the vision against which the fathers of Vatican II had warned in Gaudium et Space. It was uh, a vision profoundly influenced by a secular anthropology that asserts the socially constructed nature of all moral norms that, and, uh, and actually uh, promoted the deconstruction of all moral norms. So in this new situation, with the human rights project being pulled and tugged in all different directions, uh, it's interesting that the Catholic Church has become the principal institutional defender of the idea of the Universal Declaration as an integrated whole, not a menu from which people can add and subtract, pick and choose their favorites, but a group of interrelated, interdependent rights accompanied, uh, as Professor Weiler has indicated, with a vision of corresponding duties in Article 29 of the Universal Declaration that was actually in the drafting process meant to be at the beginning to hover over the interpretation of the whole document, but uh, things happen in committees and it got tucked in in the end, but in the end, those three articles in the end are meant to be a kind of pediment and hermeneutical key to the whole preceding declaration. So to come back to Archbishop Menorah's uh, demonstration that, that there are so many ways in which Pacham and Terrace did not innovate, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that still, that drew people so strongly to that document then and that still draws us to that document? And I think it is, people have spoken about the hope and the optimism of the document. I, th I think that's right, but I think it's something like what draws us to and inspires us in Federalist number one. That is the notion uh, that John the 23rd and Alexander Hamilton shared that we, human beings, we men and women of goodwill, we are not just corks bobbing along on the tides of history, we're not just driven along by events, that actually we have the ability to shift probabilities in a direction that is favorable to human dignity or not favorable to human dignity. We have the power to do that and in those wonderful concluding passages that have been quoted already, he tells us that we have the responsibility to do it. Thank you. Is this one on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, uh, after such uh, rich presentations, uh, provocative suggestions about it, um, it pains me very much to say that we're out of time and that therefore uh, those burning questions that have been raised in your minds and in your hearts will have to go with you. But of course, that's a much better position to be in than leaving having felt uh, satisfied or worse. Um, but before I do uh, let you go, there are at least a few words of thanks that need to be said. Um, first of all, uh, thanks to the University of Chicago for hosting us here. Thanks to the staffs of the Lumen Christi Institute and the Center for Civil and Human Rights to have assembled uh, such an impressive and complicated event. In particular, uh, Carl Hefty and Kevin Fai owe a great deal. Um, we owe a great deal to them for everything they've done. Our participation as the Center for Civil and Human Rights is, uh, has been made possible thanks to a variety of institutional partners at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, the Institute for Church Life, the Institute for Study for Scholarship in the Liberal Arts, and the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. That collaboration, for those of you who are not from Notre Dame, I, I just have to say is pretty remarkable <laughs> and, um, and is a testament really to uh, what we all regard as the universal importance of this topic, this document, and everything 
that it entails for our discussions about our engagement in the world. Um, so uh, hopefully inspired now by everything we've heard, we can go out and do the work that John the 23rd urged us to do to make these principles real for the cause of justice in the world again today. Thank you very much for having been here. Help me in thanking our guests, please.